Well, as we have been studying the biblical feast of Israel, we began with Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. And then last week we looked at Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. Today we're going to be looking at Sukkoth or that which is known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And what we're going to be looking at in our time together is both the historical significance of this feast, but also the prophetic fulfillment. Now the feast begins on the 15th day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar known as Tishri. It comes five days after Yom Kippur, and it lasts for seven days. Well, actually eight days if you want to count the last day, that is the day after the feast. They have it as a Sabbath. And so a, a day of solemn rest. So a lot of times uh, the Jewish people actually celebrate it in eight days. Now the Hebrew word or title for this feast is known as Sukkoth, which is translated booth or tabernacle. And its Latin counterpart means a tent or a hut. Now, in its name, it basically means a temporary dwelling. And it was usually used when farmers would, would set up a hut during the time of harvest, which goes to connecting it with the agricultural significance of this feast day, according to the scriptures out of Exodus, in Exodus 23 and 34. But it was also intended to be a reminder of the type of dwelling that the Israelites dwelt in during their 40 years of wilderness wanderings after their exodus from Egypt. And that's found in Leviticus chapter 23. Now to celebrate this feast today, what the Jewish people do is they build a temporary shelter for the duration of the feast. And it was meant to describe these events that I just re referenced about the harvest and about their time in the wilderness. Now during this time, during these seven days that these temporary huts or tents or booths are up, they would take their meals in. In other words, they would eat their meals in these tents, and oftentimes they would sleep in them as well. And what this reveals is the dual purpose or reason for this celebration. Now again, let's look at the first reason they celebrated, was the celebration of the harvest. Since the feast occurs at the end of the harvest season, it is also known as the Feast of Ingathering. In contrast to the somber mood of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this was a time of great celebration, great rejoicing, as the people celebrated the final ingathering of the harvest for the next year, a harvest that God had provided. That is why the feast is also known as the season of our joy. And this is brought out in Leviticus chapter 23, the second part of verse 40. It says there, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Now the first part of verse 40, we see the physical symbol of this celebration. And it says, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day of the fruit, first day, the fruit of the beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, balls of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. Basically, the people were to bring specific fruits. Most likely it was the etrog, which is a large yellowish citrus fruit, kind of like a lemon, but bigger with a whole lot of bumps on it. That's what it looks like. And they would then bind the palm, the willow, and the myrtle branches together and weigh them before the Lord at the appropriate time. And basically what they would do is they would stand there and then they would, they would wave it west, east, south, and north. And so that is how they waved the palm branches during this time, or what is known as um, this, uh, in fact, I forgot to write down what it was, but these three willow uh, branches put together. Now, the second purpose of this feast was to celebrate how God had provided provision and shelter for them for the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness after their Egyptian bondage and before they were to enter into the promised land. So they dealt in these huts, in these booths for these 40 years. This is also why it's called a joyous occasion. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 23. It says, You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now there's an interesting scripture trying to relate that which happened there uh, in their wilderness wanderings with what is going to happen in the future, and it has everything to do with this Feast of Tabernacles. 
there's a beautiful scripture about how they celebrate it. Now, in the time of the reign of the Messiah, Isaiah, the time that Isaiah calls beautiful, all those who were left in Jerusalem whom the Lord had cleansed, look at what it says during this time. This is the end times, at the end times. He said, Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and her assemblies, a cloud of smoke by day and a shining of the flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering, and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat, for a place of refuge and for a shelter from the storm and rain. Notice what it said. There would be a cloud of smoke by day and then a shining of a flaming fire by night. This is coming up at the end times. And we see this exact same thing, that this is what God did for the children of Israel there in the wilderness for those 40 years. In Exodus chapter 13, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And so not only did the people construct these temporary dwelling or booths, but understand this, and this is key for our understanding. The Lord himself became a tabernacle for them, a covering, both for day and for night, providing refuge and shelter. And so we can see the great joy that this would bring into the hearts of the people as they remembered and as we remember God's provision, protection, refuge, and shelter. Now, the part of the celebration that is missing today that was held back in the day of Jesus and before are the sacrifices and offering that were a part of these seven days. Now these are listed out in the book of Numbers, chapter 29, verses 12 through 38, if you'd like to see what they are. Now with the other feasts, many of the other feasts, the Jews also developed other traditions related to the celebration of the feast, but not specifically brought out in the Bible, not specifically prescribed by God in His Word. But they arose from oral tra tradition, oral translation, oral tradition during the time of Jesus and again and before. Now two of the practices I'd like to share with you have specific significance or special significance to the coming of the Messiah as Jesus and also Jesus' proclamations during this time. Let me share with you the, both of these. The first one is known as the draw, water drawing ceremony. And here water is drawn from the pool of Salaam. And it was during each of these feast days, the seven feast days, they would draw water from the pool of Siloam. It began in the morning when the morning sacrifices were being prepared. And so what happened is a progression would go from the temple over to the pool of Siloam. And the priest who led the procession had a golden water jug. And he filled that water jug up. And then they went back to the temple through the water gate, which is, that's, I find that quite significant. And there he poured out the water before the altar. Now on the last day of the feast, also known as the great day of the feast, this is when Jesus stood up at this time and he cried out these words. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then the Apostle John explained what Jesus was talking about. He said, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now the second tradition that happened during the Feast of Tabernacles was when the worshipers would make their way into the court of the women. And there, four very tall candelabras were set up they were anywhere from 75 to 100 feet tall. And they were lit every single night of the feast. And since the temple was on the Mount Zion, which was above Jerusalem, everybody could see these lights and see the illumination in the sky that they brought. It says that on the very next day, Jesus then entered the temple where the scribes and the Pharisees confronted him when they wanted him to condemn the woman caught in adultery. 
But he said to them, Let that person who is without sin cast the first stone. And since nobody cast a stone because everybody is with sin, Jesus then went up to the woman and said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. But he also made this proclamation. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so as we see, Jesus was connecting himself to this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. He was connecting this feast to himself, the Messiah, which is seen in several other passages in the scriptures. I'd like to share with you just a couple. The first one I'd like to share with you comes out of the Gospel of John in chapter 1. John chapter 1, 1 through 1, 5, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so this title, The Word, is a title for God, the Creator, the giver of life, the giver of the light of life. But how do we know that he is speaking of Jesus here? I mean, it doesn't say the name Jesus. So how do we know that this is Jesus? And then how does Jesus relate to the feast? That Jesus is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Where do we get this from? Well, we get it all from verse 14. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this title, the Word, is a title for God. And John makes it clear that this title then for God was the title for Jesus. Now the key to understanding this and understanding how Jesus then relates to or is a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is found in the Greek word that is used here for the word dwelt. It literally means to tabernacle. And so the word Jesus, and so the word that is Jesus, basically he's saying the word tabernacled among us. And so not only was this feast a remembrance of God's past miracles, protection, and provision, but it also pointed to the coming of the Messiah, who would in like manner be our shelter and be our rest. And that's exactly what Jesus said about himself and for people to come to him. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. But this feast also looks forward. It looks into the future, into the coming of the Messiah and how this will not only be, in fact, this is going to be the only feast that is kept for the 1,000 year reign of Christ. This is the only feast that is kept during the 1,000 year reign. In the day of judgment, I find it interesting. God said that he will raise up a house or literally a tabernacle of David when he brings back his people into the land forever. So that's talking about a future event. And he's going to raise up the tabernacle of David. Look what he says. And this is coming out of Amos chapter 9, verse 11. On that day, talking about the end times, on that day I'll raise up a tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I'll repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. And so what Amos was talking about, what God was prophesying here, was the fulfillment of the coming Messiah who will rule and reign in what we know as the millennial reign of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of the Messiah. Which may very be, well be why this feast is the only feast that is celebrated during these 1,000 years. Now this is found in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, the 14th chapter. I mean, I'll get there with you, but I need to set the stage. So let me set the stage here. In Zechariah 14, 9, look at what it says. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now let me just stop there because when Jesus came, they thought he was going to come and set himself up as king and start the kingdom at that time. And so the king was always referred to as the Messiah. But notice what he's called here. The Lord. The Lord, Jehovah. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. 
It says, in that day it shall be, the Lord is one and his name one. Now that word one that is used here is significant because it, it's significant in how God himself is one. His name is one and the Hebrew of that word one is the word ichad. Ichad is the same word used that the Jews use every Sabbath when they say the Shema or the telling or what's known as the hearing. In the English it is those hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now in the Hebrew it's Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ichad. And so the same word that is used in the same word one is used in both of these passages. The same word that is used by Isaiah, how the Lord is one and His name is one. And here in Deuteronomy where it says, and the, the hero is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is the same word, Echad. Echad means a composite unity. In the scripture that basically means many which make up one. And this is where we get the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I, it's way too much to go into the tr doctrine of the Trinity, but if you want to, go to the website, Spiritual Transformation website that I have up. And I actually have a whole article written on how uh, the Trinity was developed and why we could say that God is three in one. And so you can go to the site and read that. But going back to our text in Zechariah, it goes on to say how this feast will be kept during these days. In Zechariah 14, 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, this is during the thousand year reign, shall go up from year to year to worship the king. Now here's the name of the king, the Lord of hosts. So the Messiah is called the Lord of hosts to keep what? The Feast of Tabernacles. Now last week I left off with a teaser saying how the feasts were actually a shadow of that which is to come, from what the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 1 said. He said, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come. And so the shadow of the good things to come is how the Messiah will fulfill these feasts. That the shadow of the law, which the feasts are a part of, is actually the shadow of the Messiah, of the coming Messiah. Now, as I have mentioned in the past feast, I have mentioned that how the feasts point to something greater. They always point it to something greater than the actual celebration. Remember, Jesus said that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus not only acknowledged that he attended these feasts, not only in his life, but also Jesus kept them in his death, that he would fulfill them in the future after his death. Notice the progression starting with the Feast of Passover. Jesus literally died on the Feast of Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. And the Apostle Paul actually acknowledged this when he said that Jesus is the first fruit from the dead. So from his death, burial, and resurrection, they actually fit. He actually was he actually died on Passover there on the cross. He was buried the next day on the Feast of Unleavened Bread because he was without sin. And then he rose on the Feast of First Fruits that first day of the week following Passover. He rose on that day from the dead and was the first fruits from the dead. Now the last three feasts, oh, the, then the fourth feast. I forgot about the fourth, fourth feast, my mouth. Hello. The Feast of Pentecost. It was a day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the church, upon the disciples, the church, of which Jesus is the head of. And then finally you have the last three feasts, or the fall feast of Israel, that we have been studying for these last three weeks. And then we see how they fit, and what I see, how they potentially can be fulfilled by the second coming of the Messiah, or Jesus. Why do I say that? Let's look at it just for a moment with me. The next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. And the next major event that is going to happen is known as the Rapture. This is when the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we that are alive and remaining upon this earth shall be caught up in the air to be with Jesus forever. That's the next major event to come. 
and we see that the Feast of Trumpets is the Feast of the Blowing of the Trumpet, which talks about the special covenant relationship that God has with His people. And so we can see that feast, it can literally be, be fulfilled in Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, after that then comes Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. After the Great Tribulation, the last seven years, of the, the, the last week of the 70 weeks of Daniel, it says that Jesus will come back at that time and redeem all Israel back unto himself as he comes back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords with all of his, all those who are believers, the church following him. And that's the very purpose of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the, re, the purpose of Yom Kippur was the redemption of the nation of Israel. That what it, that's what it was all about. That's what we saw last week when we looked at the feast. And finally, there's the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the only feast in the Bible that is talked about as being celebrated in the millennial reign of Christ or the millennial reign of the Messiah, found in Zechariah 14. And it is when Jesus will establish his throne and tabernacle there in Jerusalem, which is found in Ezekiel chapter 37. And it's what John described in his vision of Revelation 21, 22. Look what he said. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In other words, the Lord God and the Lamb are its tabernacle. And so we are now through our fall feast, the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, our trumpets, which we saw two weeks ago, the Feast of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, which we saw last week, and then now the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkoth, which celebrates not only the harvest, as the Feast of Ingathering, but also how God provided for them in the wilderness and how this will then be the last feast and the only feast then that will be celebrated in the millennial reign of Christ. And so with that, we're finished with our feast. And I hope you have a great meal and a feast for yourself. Take care and God bless.